Okay, Bishop, thank you very much for taking out the time. I guess this, we could call it maybe the, just like the state of the state, the, yes. st the, state, <laughs> the state of, of the, the diocese. The state of the diocese, diocese. the state of the church. Okay, a uh, general question first. Um, how are things going? Well, um, that's an excellent way of starting because in general, things are going very well. Um, you know, we recognize the challenges that are part of the life of the church today, here and everywhere, but overall, Things are going very well. We have tens of thousands of people going to Mass every Sunday throughout the state. Uh, our schools, for the most part, are doing very well. Ch the uh, church, the diocese, is providing wonderful social services across the state. We're helping serve the needs of the community. We have lots of support from, obviously, our priests and deacons and religious and laity. So um, it's going very well. You know, we've been stressing, emphasizing evangelization the year of faith that we are participating in. And I think it has caused a certain amount of uh, renewal and rebirth in the diocese here and certainly around the world with the election of our new Pope, Pope Francis, has been a very exciting episode for all of us. So overall, I would say the state of the church, the state of the diocese is very positive and, and very strong. All right, before we talk about the diocese problem, let's go to the Pope for a second. I know it's Easter, so a lot of people come back to church on Easter, but there seems to be an uptick in attendance in either the story Easter Sunday, where a lot of young people said that they can actually relate to Pope Francis as opposed to Pope Benedict. Do you think that could be one of the reasons why so many people are coming back? Well, I think anytime there's a new leader elected, whether it's on a national scene or certainly a new leader for the, for the church universal, I think there's a kind of response like that. And it's wonderful to see. It, I think it says to us that the Holy Spirit is continuing to work in the church. The Holy Spirit's continuing to breathe new life in the church, and that's manifested in ways uh, that are very tangible and very real, such as the selection of a new pope. Obviously, Pope Francis has caused a great deal of excitement and inspiration for lots of people, including young people, and we hope that continues. We hope it's not just a flash in the pan, but we hope it continues because certainly his his message is very strong and, and very positive and, and very uplifting for all of us. Well, he made a connection to Rhode Island with little Dominic from Our Lady of Grace that was, when he saw him in the crowd. That was a too. beautiful scene and yeah. one that inspired people here and across the country and around the world, really, that received widespread uh, coverage. But that's the kind of thing the Pope is, is doing. I, I think he's um, preaching not so much with his words, although his words have been very fine as well, but also with his deeds and he's speaking volumes by what he's saying and, and by what he's doing. You know, you basically run a big corporation. What do you, if you had a chance to sit down and talk to him, what, did you want him, what do you want to see him do to help not just the Diocese of, diocese of Providence, but other dioceses? Well, I would certainly be um, very hesitant to try to suggest what the Pope should do. However, um, uh, you know, he, he knows what to do as, as a bishop and as, as Pope, but certainly to continue this theme that the church has been talking about, even with Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict, who is a marvelous shepherd for us, but the themes that Pope Francis have already begun, that sense of um, evangelization, the outreach of going beyond the sanctuary of our churches, be going beyond the walls of our churches and making ourselves present in the world and in the community to talk about the good news of Christ and all that the gospel entails and to continue teaching and preaching and serving the needs of the community. Pope Francis has been known to be uh, a priest and a bishop, an archbishop, now a pope who's in the streets with his people. And uh, that's a wonderful signal for all of us, certainly for me as a bishop and, and for our priest as well, to continue that process of reaching out, embracing people, a sense of evangelization and proclaiming the faith. I guess I would hope, and I, I think he will and encourage, uh, continue that. I guess with all the organizations that serve the poor, the Catholic Church obviously is up there, and it's not just the poor, it's schools, hospitals. Do people have a sense of what you know, the church is doing in the community? Well, I, I certainly try to keep that alive. I, I think sometimes people in the church, but beyond the church as well, forget about all the great things the church does every day. Uh, again, certainly in terms of our parishes and the uh, spiritual and, and uh, pastoral services we provide in our own parish communities, but in our schools that serve the needs of our community, Catholic and non-Catholic alike, and our food pantries, the, the soup kitchens, the homeless shelter we have, the Keep the Heat On program we started to provide heating assistance for people. All of these programs work day in and day out. They serve the needs of the community, Catholic and non-Catholic alike. 
if that were ever to cease, that would be a real loss, not just for the church and for Catholics, but for our whole community and our whole state. So uh, we're very proud of the work we do. Perhaps we should talk even more about it because we do make an enormous difference uh, for people and for families uh, across the state every day. Let's talk about demographics for a second because I know that's something you look at all the time. Uh, people are flocking to Narragansett, South County, to you know, the Smithfield area, but the inner cities, really, that's where it's losing population. Uh, the church sees that and has been affected by that, correct? Sure, and of course we are involved in some demographic changes here in Rhode Island as well as other places in the country, of course, and people are leaving the cities in some cases and moving to the um, suburbs or the or more rural areas, uh, and certainly places like South County that you mentioned. So that's not an unusual phenomenon, but at the same time in our, chur in our churches and in, in the cities and some of our urban centers, we're also seeing the growth, the influx of uh, large uh, Latino Hispanic uh, population, which is a great gift for our church. The Latino community, the Hispanic community, brings so many uh, gifts and talents and enthusiasm and joy about the faith. So even in our cities, at least in some places, uh, the Latino community is giving new birth and new energy to the life of the church, different perhaps than it was before, but it's a real gift. But as you say, a lot of the population that we've been um, uh, working with and serving has, has moved to other areas as well. Well, St. Charles, we went and it, it was absolutely packed yes. with people. I think the challenge there though is you know, financial. So if you know a parish is you know, bringing people in, but they can't pay their bills, how do you work that out? Well, and again, I think it's a process of teaching people um, across the church, not just the Catholic church, but the faith community in general, about the importance of stewardship that they do have an obligation to support the work of the church personally and spiritually and financially. Um, that's true with uh, churches in our city and, and across the board. Um, we try to encourage in people that sense of stewardship and a, a generosity in helping people um, support the work of the church in, in many different ways. The numbers might not be there for you. I think you have about 145 priests give or take uh, a few in the diocese, 145, excuse me, parishes. Parishes, yes. Parishes. Yeah. Um, I know you wrote a year ago about the declining number of priests and what could happen in the next couple of years. I think you're seeing in the diocese now, Father Cardenti running three churches. Is that going to be something we're gonna see more often? I think so, and it's one model we will use and the numbers you indicate are certainly correct. Um, we do have a declining number of active priests. Right now it's something like 160 active priests in the diocese and almost 100 um, retired priest, I believe, who also provide a lot of valuable service for us. But in the last two years, for example, to illustrate your point, we've lost from the active ministry in the Diocese of, of Providence um, about 25 priests. Now that's through death, retirement, leave of absence, religious communities leaving the state. It's about 25 priests, give or take a couple. But in that same two year period, we only have five being ordained. So that's a net loss of 20 priests serving the people of this uh, state, this diocese in just two years. And we've seen it happening in recent years. I think that change has accelerated a little bit and it's certainly going to continue going forward into the future. So that means that we're going to have to make some changes. We're going to have to be creative. We're going to have to be flexible and we will certainly do our very, very best to provide for the uh, spiritual and, and pastoral needs of all the people of, of this diocese. So how do you get creative? Well, uh, as you've suggested, for example, it might mean that one priest has to take care of a couple parishes. It might mean some priests are doing part-time work here in our offices and also in our parishes. It might mean that some parishes have to share their resources and their uh, facilities and their programs. Uh, it might mean a decline, a change in Sunday mass schedule, which I think is a big issue for us. If we have a, a church that seats 800 people and they have five masses on weekend, but only a thousand people are attending, the, the mass schedule is an important component of this too. The people are used to going to the same mass every Sunday and sitting in the same pew every Sunday next to the same people every Sunday some of those things will change because we can't expect a priest, we can't expect one priest to say seven or eight masses in a weekend when before there were two or three priests doing the same thing. Mass schedules will have to change, communities have to come together, have to share resources, try to be 
uh, flexible in assigning priests. Uh, but we'll be okay. It's, um, it's an ongoing challenge for us, but we're still blessed with 160 priests who are active in ministry and close to another 100 who are retired and still helping in many ways as their health permits. So we have a lot of resources. Um, and uh, in the end, we're, we're going to be fine, but it's going to mean uh, some changes for people that they will see in their churches and, and in their pews. Now, I know you're going through this, the assignments probably <laughs> this week for the openings that you do have. For this year, or maybe even the next 12 months, do you see one person now running two parishes that has not happened before? Like, I, for example, in Boroughville. Yeah, that certainly is possible. And as you say, as we speak today, we're right in the process of doing some assignments. So um, some of those questions aren't even answered yet. The personnel situation is one that changes day by day and week by week, literally, depending on the availability of priests and situations in our parishes and the health of our priests and, and so forth. So it's hard to give you an exact uh, prediction of how things will happen because at this point, I don't even know. But um, things are evolving. And the point, I think, is that uh, we can expect changes. And in some cases, there will be one priest taking care of two parishes. Um, there might be a little team of priests helping out in, in a certain area. Some parishes will be sharing resources. Um, there will be changes in mass schedule, changes in hospital ministry, for example. We've had a lot of priests involved in health care, which is a very important ministry. Uh, but that might change as well. So we're looking at all these assignments, campus ministries, high school, health care, parish, chancery. All of these things are um, in the process of evolving. So in the next 12 months, do you plan on closing any parishes? Um, at the moment, there's very possibly there might be one or two parishes affected. It's very hard still to predict because some of these things are still in process. Uh, and there's a difference between closing a parish in closing a church. As you know, we've had a number of situations in the last few years where the parish communities, in a sense, the, the canonical structures have closed and have merged, but their parishes, the churches, the parish churches have remained open. That's one scenario too, where there's no longer parish communities as canonical entities, but the churches are still open under some kind of new protocol. So it's very complicated. Sometimes, um, uh, churches close and merge, sometimes parishes close, sometimes the parish can become a mission, serviced by another place, um, sometimes they have part-time priests or full-time priests. All of that is still evolving. And I saw somewhere where they closed three parishes in a, a diocese and they took the money, they sold the property, and they took the money and they built a new church, a new name, and I guess the people that were in those parishes. Um, is that something maybe we could see down the road? Because you would never have to do Bishop a Capital campaign for 20 years <laughs> with, a, <laughs> with a new building. Yes. Or well, is that it's not possible. feasible in Rhode Island? Yeah, it's, it's, it's possible, I suppose. As you know, we, we've opened a couple of brand new churches in the last couple of years down in South County in North Kingston. Um, so it's possible to build new churches. On one hand, I could see the, the uh, the possibility of closing some churches and building a new one, that's pretty unusual. If you have beautiful churches, what do you do with them? You certainly... Uh, I think one they turned into was in Menden, Massachusetts. They turned it into a library. Yeah, well, so, there's some possibilities, of course. And I went through this in terms of parish restructuring and reorganization, certainly when I was in the Diocese of Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh was one of the first dioceses in the country to go through large-scale parish reorganization. But other places, here in New England, certainly in Boston and and other places around the country, Cleveland has been through a major restructuring, and, and Baltimore, Detroit, most of your large cities in the Northeast, Great Lakes area, have been through this kind of parish reorganization. <clears throat> I do not envision, by the way, for the sake of the record, I do not envision a large-scale, massive reorganization of our parishes here in Rhode Island. I've seen what that does to people and to parishes. It's a very, very difficult and painful process but we'll certainly be looking at specific areas and trying to respond to the needs one at a time. So what's your policy? Does the church or the pastor have to come to you and say, look, we're out of money, there's really nothing left here? Or do you make that decision ahead of time? Well, it's a two-way street. We never make the decision ahead of time, but certainly the diocese and our diocesan staff, they do a great job of monitoring the health 
of our parishes. In terms of attendance and finances, the things you can measure easily, um, we do a great job, I think, of trying to monitor those situations and providing assistance for parishes. On the other hand, sometimes the um, pastors themselves will come and say, I can't do this anymore. I'm running out of money. I'm running out of people. We need to do something here. So we try to respond to that as well. Ideally, of course, a lot of this does originate at the local level because they know what the situation is. But sometimes, too, the parishes, the pastors need and want some help and guidance because they cannot do it all by themselves. And they realize that their parish is part of a bigger picture that involves other parishes and neighboring parishes and other people as well. Well, some of them have huge endowments that they're using. Does it come to a point where you as the bishop say, you know, you're using some of that endowment, let's combine with another parish? Well, again, that's a, a very tricky uh, situation because there are canonical um, regulations about what you can do with um, uh, particular uh, funds, resources that belong to a particular parish. Some parishes have large endowments and not too many people. Uh, some parishes have lots and lots of people and not too much money. Right. Uh, so there is a uh, slow process that has to take place there. But um, if a parish has some resources and certainly they've been generated by the people of that parish, they have a right to, to use those funds to maintain the life of the church. But sometimes if a parish has lots of money, but no people, it still cannot be an active, vibrant parish. So sometimes it's money, sometimes it's people, sometimes it's the, uh, the lack of clergy that might drive some of these parish situations. Uh, speaking of lack of clergy, you have a new class of deacons. I lost count of how many were. There were 21 ordained. ordained 21 just a ordained. Ago, yes. Okay. Uh, how is that going to be different with them as opposed to deacons in the past, or is it going to be the same? I think it's going to be pretty much the same. Um, we have ordained a wonderful group of, of <clears throat> permanent deacons, and they will add to the good work our permanent deacons have been doing for many years here in the Diocese of, of Providence. They're great guys who are well trained in, in serving the needs of, of the church uh, in lots of ways. A lot of their service has taken place um, in their parish community, but we've also asked all of our deacons to be involved in service in the community too, in the ACI, in programs of youth ministry, campus ministry, uh, in religious education, other social services. So deacons are defined by the service they give. And it's a liturgical service at the altar, but it's also community service, social service, charitable service in our churches and in our community. So um, we're blessed by the deacons and uh, the group we've just ordained will continue the work of our deacons. It's a wonderful group of guys. I'm very, very happy with them and, and very proud of them. Uh, Bishop, the sexual abuse scandal obviously rocked the Catholic Church over the years. You had three uh, priests just in the last year or so be removed from active ministry. Uh, how do you deal with that years later after all of this? And then in your own diocese, three three priests, including one, by the way, who was extremely popular, mm -hmm. uh, Monsignor Allard. Yeah. Well, that's always, of course, a very, very painful and, and disappointing uh, experience to go through. First of all, for the victims themselves who have been abused, even if it's many years ago, sometimes those wounds don't heal at all, well, certainly not easily. It's a difficult thing for, for the individuals who are abused and for their families. It's also extremely, extraordinarily painful for the priests who, who are accused of abuse, uh, maybe something they put behind them 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. And it's extraordinarily difficult for me as a bishop to have to deal with those things because I realize that uh, there's a great deal of pain involved for the victims, the families, the priest, the parishioners who love their priest, for a brother priest who've known these men for a long time. It's a terrible thing to deal with, but we've been very aggressive on that and we will continue to be very aggressive. We're doing all that we can, as much as any organization, institution, providing a safe environment for our young people. We're very diligent about that, very vigilant. We're working hard. Um, Is that hurt, still hurting the declining numbers? Do you think that's part of maybe some of the declining numbers you see in some of the churches? Declining numbers of people? Parishioners. Oh, I suppose, um, you know, I guess there are lots of reasons that have caused declining numbers in the Catholic Church, but it's also a social phenomenon. I think it's taking place in other religious communities and across the nation. Misconduct, sexual abuse, other kinds of inappropriate behavior. Sure, that's part of it, but I think the broader picture is the increasing secularism 
and the, the practical atheism that's part of our society today. People just don't have God at the center of their lives the way they used to. Apart from questions of abuse and misbehavior and misconduct, people just don't have that place for God in their lives every day and in their families. And we see it, I think, reflected across the nation in the increasing secularism and paganism and the atheism and some of the uh, breakdown of traditional moral values. Uh, so that's the broader picture, I think, affecting not just the Catholic Church, but all faith communities. Do you see somewhere along the line priests getting married? And being well, married? as we know, there are already some right. priests who are married, um, Catholic priests in our country and certainly around the world. So that would add to the numbers. Well, yeah, it probably would. Um, and it has been part of the, uh, the history and tradition of the church to have married priests, but it's also a discipline we've had in place now for a thousand years. And that's a long time to develop a very good and noble and effective um, tradition of discipline, a spiritual discipline that we've asked our priests to embrace so that they can reflect the presence of Christ and they are free uh, to give themselves wholeheartedly to their people and to the service of Christ. So do I see an imminent change uh, in that? No, I, I don't think so, even with the new Pope. But who knows, I can't predict what the future. What would your reaction either. be if you heard him say, you know, we're exploring this idea? Well, my first reaction would probably be, it's too late for me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't know. It's something we'd have to see in what context he would say that, and would he do it gradually? Would it be something for some missionary parts of the world and not the Western world? Um, I, I think of a, a dear old lady who is one of our housekeepers at one of my parishes in Pittsburgh. Uh, and there were three or four priests in the rectory and she did a great job helping us and taking care of us. She said, there's a reason you guys don't get married because nobody will have you. <laughs> so I've often thought of that as the best excuse for celibacy. <laughs> Let's talk quickly about uh, schools because you mentioned them. Uh, no schools closing this year? Um, not that I'm aware of as we sit here today. Again, that's a fluid situation. Uh, we're very grateful and very blessed that in the last two or three years we have not had to close any schools. And that's a wonderful thing. And I think our school population is pretty stable. But what's important to emphasize is we have terrific schools on an elementary school level and certainly on a high school level. Our school's office, our administrators, our teachers, our parents, our staff, our volunteers form great teams. They cooperate together really well and provide excellent education. So many of the things that public schools throughout our state are striving for, we have in terms of discipline and performance and outcome and graduation rates and attendance. Uh, we have that in our Catholic schools, and that's why they deserve uh, whatever public support we could send their way. And then uh, finally, Bishop, when we're looking, we would talk, you had mentioned that maybe there'd be one or two parishes down the line here in the next uh, couple of months that might have either one pastor looking over two sure. churches or a possible merger. I mentioned West Warwick, Pawtucket, Woonsocket. Those are the ones that have so many parishes. West Warwick has 10. Yes. They have like 20,000 people. When do you eventually go in there and say, hey, look, even though no one's coming to you, we really need to make a change? Do you see that in the next year? Um, we're going to be looking at that ongoing process. Again, it's an ongoing process. I don't have a specific timeline to say that we're going to target this area this month or that area that month. We've made some changes in Pawtucket. We're working on some of the parishes in Woonsocket. West Warwick is certainly an area that we do have to look at. Um, certainly some parishes in the city of Providence, too, are changing and have to share some resources. So I don't have a specific game plan, nor do I have a specific timeline. All of that is under active discussion, and it's part of the ongoing life of the church. You know, I'm sure the diocese was looking at that mm, five and 10 and 20 years ago, and we'll continue looking at it going forward. We're also working very hard and hoping and praying for more vocations to the priesthood. That's a very important pastoral need for us. Um, we have wonderful priests in this diocese, but they're getting older. Uh, we have lots of priests reti approaching retirement age, and our guys are generous, but we can't expect them to work forever. We need some younger priests, so we're working very hard on vocations so that we'll have the, the priest we need, the pastors, the shepherds, to take care of um, God's people. Is the possibility of the Maronites buying one of the churches? That is under active uh, consideration right now. Again, as, as we sit here today, uh, we're looking at St. Anne's Church in Cranston that has very 
very significant financial problems. It's clear they cannot survive in their current situation. So we are right now in conversation with the Maronites. We hope to have a decision and announcement soon, but we have some work to do with that yet. But our hope is and our plan is to keep the church open uh, for the needs of the people uh, and worship of the people uh, in some form or format. But the parish as it exists right now obviously has to change in some way. They have enormous financial problems. They just can't go on. But we're going to try hard to keep the church building open for people. Well, that would remain a, a Catholic church. Yes, uh, obviously. Absolutely. The Maronites obviously are right. part of the Catholic right. church. So um, but it's they a different, would different rite, different form of liturgy, but we hope to provide the Latin uh, rite, the English mass yeah. for people as well. So, but they would assume that debt if they purchased the, the church? Well, again, if, if they purchase it, then we would have the proceeds of that sale to, to uh, retire the debt, which is in the neighborhood right now of $800,000. Again, that's a ballpark figure right. and it changes, but it's enormous debt for a small parish um, and they, they're just no longer viable. We're gonna try to keep the church open in some way for the people. Now, you sold St. Lawrence, I think the church and the rectory. In Centerdale, yes. Okay, so once a process like that happens and you pay off the debt, where does the remaining money go? Does it go to the church that merged with Well, it? unfortunately, I don't think we've had that situation yet where we've sold off assets and had any money left over. In every case that I'm familiar with, when we've uh, had to close the church, and there's only been a couple, we've had to close the church and sell the assets um, that's used to pay off debts and in most cases, in fact all the cases I'm familiar with, the, the proceeds of the sale did not fulfill the debt. So uh, I hope to have that problem someday to sell off assets that we have some leftover money but that has not been a problem. And I don't foresee it being a problem because the churches that are struggling have enormous financial problems. And then there's unfunded liabilities for pensions and, and, and insurance and so forth. Um, when parishes close, often it's because they are no longer viable financially. If, some, if a parish comes to you and you know they're in financial debt, there's no way they can do a capital campaign to wipe that out? Oh, sure, they... and some have. Um, and, and again, capital campaigns are, are often used for, for capital needs, a new roof on the church or a new parking lot or a new heating system uh, or an addition to the church. Uh, capital campaigns are very difficult when you tell people that that's solely going to be used to pay off a debt. Um, but sometimes they're done in, in combination. And sometimes parishes look at all their resources. Is there something they can sell? Can they reduce their staff? Can they share the resources with somebody else? And we've looked at all those, those options. Again, let me emphasize, for the most part, our parishes are doing very well. But we have a handful that are in pretty serious financial difficulty, and we're working every day uh, with those parish communities. And finally, uh, the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers going to win the Super Bowl this year? Um, I haven't had a lot of luck predicting that. <laughs> I think there have been a lot of changes uh, for the teams across the National Football League. But, How have um, you survived eight years being a Steelers fan here? Well, <laughs> and just, a Pirates fan and a Penguins well, just fan. Just remind everybody that in the eight years I've been here, the Steelers have, have won two Super yes. Bowls and the Patriots <laughs> have not quite gotten to that point yet. So it's been pretty easy to survive as a Steelers fan. Well, Bishop, thank you very much for taking out the time. You're very welcome. A wonderful conversation. Okay, thank, you. thank you.